Hi, I'm Anthony Bouchon, developer advocate at Google, and welcome to GKE Essentials. Did you know that GKE clusters can scale up to 15,000 nodes? Owning a cluster with that sheer scale is hard for me to comprehend at times, but let's dive into it together. This video is the first part of a two-part introduction to building large-scale GKE clusters. Over the course of these videos, we'll talk at a high level around two key areas. One, why you might consider building clusters with thousands of nodes, and two, what considerations you should account for when designing clusters to be able to scale. Kubernetes especially shines for those of you looking to build a platform to run your company's workloads. It gives you a means for abstracting away infrastructure. No need to directly deploy workloads to a specific machine. Rather, you deploy it to the cluster and Kubernetes will make sure it runs somewhere. It also gives you declarative APIs that codify a workload's characteristics and enforces that behavior. You can even extend these APIs with your own definitions of how workloads should run. This is why one of the founders of Kubernetes went as far as calling the open source technology a platform for building platforms. Now these platforms that you build could be home to a set of large, resource-intensive workloads such as batch processing or machine learning, or they could also be the generalized way in which you enable developers to access infrastructure for their various and potentially differing workloads. It should be noted that when you're building multi-tenant clusters, the harder isolation or stronger boundaries that you require between these workloads, the more likely it is you should consider using multiple smaller clusters. Nevertheless, using fewer large-scale clusters in some of these cases can help in a handful of ways. One, they can help you minimize the number of clusters you have to actively manage. This helps with problems like configuration drift across clusters or juggling multiple concurrent upgrade cycles. Two, you can more easily handle resource spikes. If you're building a platform, you may have many different teams as users, each with their own plans for rolling out their own workloads to the platform or scaling up their workloads. Building a cluster that can scale to larger sizes can help absorb these varying demands concurrently. And finally, for those of you building specialized platforms for batch processing or machine learning, building a large-scale cluster brings the simplicity of the Kubernetes API to these complex, performance-intensive workloads. Even if you're not looking to build a cluster that's 15,000 nodes, you can still realize these benefits by building a cluster that can scale to house large amounts of resources. So let's talk about considerations for designing and building a large-scale cluster like this. When it comes down to it, as a platform builder, you are providing a contract to your end users and their workload. You ask them to package their workload in a container with assurances that your platform will run that workload reliably. So at the heart of building large-scale clusters is not just the concept of adding more nodes or more pods, but rather figuring out how to maintain your cluster reliability when doing so. Of course, we can't cover every single design consideration for large-scale clusters in this episode, but let's dive into where you should start thinking. It's important to think of cluster design across two categories. There are the considerations at the greater Kubernetes level, which revolves around the Kubernetes API and their objects such as pods, services, namespaces, and these are not specific or limited to any one infrastructure provider. Then there are considerations at the GKE level, which include Google Cloud resources such as VPCs, underlying compute, storage, and GKE-specific features that help tune your cluster to reach these larger sizes. We'll actually cover the Google Cloud and GKE parts in part two of this series, so let's cover the Kubernetes resources first. Kubernetes scalability is defined by the special interest group focused on scalability as a multi-dimensional envelope. Within this envelope, your cluster will work and do so reliably. This envelope has configuration limitations at various dimensions. Could be the number of pods, the number of namespaces, the number of secrets. So when designing a cluster for large scale, 
It helps to understand and start thinking about how your cluster will fit within this envelope. Now, I definitely don't work with multi-dimensional envelopes on a day-to-day -day basis, so let's actually talk a little bit about how an envelope like this works. In the envelope of Kubernetes scalability, dimensions are not always independent of one another. An example, in Kubernetes, we have the ability to run 110 pods per node. We're also able to run thousands of nodes in a given cluster. But to do both at the same time? This likely would result in an unreliable cluster as we are stretching multiple dimensions too far, pods per node, nodes, and total pods in the cluster. In a scenario like this, knowing how these dimensions relate to one another can help you make adjustments, like changing the maximum number of pods per node in your cluster. In GKE, for these large-scale clusters, we generally recommend considering fewer pods per node than the maximum. A good starting benchmark we've seen with successful users is roughly 30 pods per node. The next thing to consider is scaling to the maximum in any one direction can taper your ability to scale across the other dimensions. So it's important to think about what resources your platform could push to the limit. A highly specialized cluster to serve as a batch processing platform, for example, might have numerous pods being created and deleted at the same time, depending on the status of jobs that are running. And this will affect pod churn. A multi-tenant enterprise platform might have hundreds of workloads across hundreds of teams, each isolated to their own set of namespaces. It's important to plan around what is most critical to make your platform on Kubernetes work for your users and to test those dimensions one at a time and independently. Finally, all the resources your platform uses in Kubernetes share an upper bound, which is set by the underlying state system for Kubernetes at CD. This not only includes the Kubernetes objects you're probably familiar with, deployments, secrets, stateful sets, etc., but also the resources that are created using custom resource definitions. In fact, many open source technologies built atop Kubernetes utilize this to persist their own objects to the Kubernetes control plane that their own set of controllers interact with. All of these objects are subject to etcd's underlying limitations, such as 800 megabytes per object type and the overall total storage of etcd. Given this, we recommend understanding the implications of what is actually getting created in your cluster. For example, the built-in Kubernetes job resource requires certain configurations to ensure that resources are cleaned up upon completion. Custom resources can also expand one resource into several others, such as pipeline runs in Tekton. These are not bad things. If you need to run Kubernetes jobs or custom resources like what Tekton provides, great. But it's important to know their behavior when building a platform for your end users. Now that we've taken a high-level walkthrough of Kubernetes scalability, we'll need to cover how to design around GKE features and Google Cloud infrastructure to support these large-scale clusters, which we'll cover in part two. In the meantime, take a look at these resources to better understand the Kubernetes scalability dimensions that we discussed today. Thank you for your time, and we will see you on the next episode, part two in GKE Essentials.